Our Torah portion for this Shabbat is uh, known by its first significant word, Baha'alotcha, complex word which contains several elements when you light the lamps. And this is a um, instruction to Aaron, the priests and the Levites, about how to light the menorah and by extension how to deal with the elements of the tabernacle in the wilderness. The portion contains chapters 8 through 11 of the fourth book of the five books of Moses, the book of Numbers. In chapters 8 and 9, as I've already begun, begun to indicate, we are dealing with the preparations for the departure from Mount Sinai, where they have been all this time, preparations for the departure from Mount Sinai and for the journey that lies ahead. And though they no, don't know it at this point, the journey is going to be a very long one. It's 100 miles from Mount Sinai to the border, the southern border of the land of Israel. So the trip could have really taken place within several days, a week, two weeks at most. Turns out to be a trip of 40 years for reasons that are explained to us a couple of portions ahead. After the presentation by Moses of the various aspects of the preparation, he calls his father-in-law, Jethro, who is known as Chovav in this particular portion. He calls together Jethro, his Midianite father-in-law, to invite him on the journey with the Israelites. And here is what Moses says to Jethro. We are setting out for the place of which the Lord has said, I will give it to you. Join us. Now, Robert Alter, who has written what is considered to be the greatest full commentary on the entire Bible since the time of Rashi. Rashi died in 1104 the greatest full commentary on the Tanakh, the entire Bible, for the past thousand years. And here is Robert Alter's comment on this passage. I'm going to read it again. We are setting out for the place of which the Lord has said, I will give it to you. And Alter says the following. In this passage, no foreshadowing is allowed to intrude. By which Alter means that Moses does not tell us by way of foreshadowing, nor does he tell Jethro, any of the difficulties that lie ahead, any of the difficulties which he must, from his own past experience, understand are going to happen. No foreshadowing. And then Moses adds another thought. For the Lord has promised a good thing for Israel, which Alter translates, promised all manner of good things, as a way of reflecting the fact that the word good is used in that sentence twice. Now I, I ask you the following question. If Moses knows about the challenges, the difficulties, the impediments, the obstacles that lie ahead, and he has faced so many of them already, why does he ignore them here and insist that the future is bright? Because, it seems to me, Moses well understands the importance of attitude in facing the unknown future. And this invitation, blocking out any intimation of problems, is intended, it seems to me, as a way of establishing an attitude toward the future. And Moses knows something else, that once the preparations are complete, the allocation of responsibility distributed, 
the financial matters, the various aspects of communal life. What remains is how to face the future. And here are the choices. With skepticism, I don't know about the future, but I'm worried. I'm really worried. So many things can go wrong. The second choice is with pessimism. I do know about the future, and the prospects are bad. I anticipate so many impediments, so many obstacles, so many dangers, so much frustration. I just know that things are going to turn dark. And Moses asks the question, is this how the future should be faced, with either skepticism or with pessimism? Of course, the author and Moses know there will be problems aplenty. There will be obstacles every step along the way. And at this point, Moses could have chosen realism. And he could have said to Jethro, come with us, though I have to warn you, we're going to face a lot of problems. Be warned. And if Moses were to have said this, he would not be wrong. Perhaps it would have been even more honest for him to have foreshadowed the future and let uh, Jethro in on what he is about to face. So why didn't Moses tell Jethro these things? After all, as I've just said, it isn't wrong to suppress the obvious, that journeys into the unknown are likely to face major problems and major challenges. Why not just tell Jethro and acknowledge openly to himself what surely lies ahead. And here's the reason, it seems to me. For to have a successful journey into the unknown, one fundamental thing is required, optimism. And this, of course, is the third option, beyond skepticism and beyond dour pessimism. Optimism, if understood correctly, does not require shutting our eyes to the challenges and the problems that lie ahead, nor to the difficulties we might, might not know how to handle at first. Because the skeptic and the pessimist are not irrational in their thinking. They understand. But what Moses also knows and what he holds to be most important, what he believes that, that to, to what transcends the realistic concerns is one's positive attitude. Now, I want to say something about attitude. Our attitude is not simply our state of mind at a particular moment and not only a reaction to the moods and to the events around us. Indeed, attitude is not simply a reaction to what happens. Attitude is not a, a, a function of what happens around us. I want to suggest to you that our attitude not only reflects reality, but can create reality. Attitude really makes reality. If you will it, it is no dream. The famous words of the founder of political Zionism, Theodore Herzl. Act, so Herzl suggests, will follow what we believe. And if we believe something good can and will happen, our will, our determination, can help to make that outcome more likely. Belief produces determination, will, which can affect positively the outcome. Op 
optimism activates. It's a choice. We can choose to be optimistic. It has the power, it seems to me, to bracket, bracket, not to ignore the problems that face us, to take them seriously, but not to make them central, to be able to push ahead with vigor and with hope. This is how I understand Moses' stance in his invitation to Jethro and why he does not bring into what he says to Jethro and his invitation. We're feeling positive about it, but boy, there are going to be a lot of problems. That's why, according to Alter, there's no foreshadowing. In a real sense, I want to suggest to you uh, Moses' invitation to Jethro is overdetermined, by which I mean he seems to say too much. His focus is on God's promise. He invokes the word good, tov, twice in the few words that he utters, once as a verb and once as a noun. It's as if Moses is deliberately underplaying the problems they will confront for the sake of promoting optimism, which is what he single-mindedly emphasizes. Because for Moses, at this crucial turning point, what matters most is that he and the people go forth with hope, hope in their hearts, and as the prayer suggests, eternity in our thoughts. And what Moses knows most of all is that at the beginning of any journey, when all the many preparations have been attended to, when roles have been allocated and positions set, when the people are ready to go, ready to go within days, Facing the future successfully depends most of all and ultimately on the way in which we approach it from the beginning. If we are skeptical, if we are pessimistic, if we focus on what can be complained about, we shall have more impediments to face than we need to. If we are optimistic, and hopeful, we shall surely be able to face the inevitable challenges and obstacles that come our way and then meet them with vigor and with hope as we, like Moses, responds positively to the future that lies ahead. And so we, as well, might emulate Moses' invitation to Jethro and think of it as our invitation as well. I'm going to repeat it. We are setting out for the place of which the Lord has said, I will give it to you. Come with us, and I will be generous to you. For the Lord has promised to be generous to the descendants of Jacob.